Welcome. My name is Emma. I'm one of the international student advisors at International Student Support. I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you so far, so it's really great to be back and joining the FIA's kickoff and welcome event. At International Student Support, we work to foster a sense of belonging and community for all students who are new to Canada, as well as students who are seeking a global experience on campus. In addition to international students, we welcome and support newcomers, so people who are permanent residents or maybe Canadians who have lived outside of the country for most of their lives and help them adjust to the new Canadian culture and environment. At our office, we do our best to connect you with the rest of the vibrant campus community and support you in reaching your academic, personal, and professional goals. So I'm just one of the members of our seven person team. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to see some of the other people you might be hearing from or communicating with if you are in touch with our office over the next few months or years. So you'll see on the screen, there's an acronym ISA. Uh, that does stand for International Student Advisor. So that's the role that I have as well as four of my other colleagues. All of our international student advisors are regulated Canadian immigration consultants or regulated in, uh, international student advisors, meaning that we're licensed immigration professionals who can provide guidance on matters uh, related to Canadian immigration. For people who are interested in a bit of data, our team does provide support close to 4,700 international students across the whole university from over 126 countries, and that's both at the undergraduate and graduate levels. This academic year, we're pleased to support uh, 472 new and returning international graduate students. So you're part of that last number there. One of the reasons why I'm presenting at today's se session is that I am the designated international student advisor for Yates School of Graduate Studies. So um, the different advisors support different faculties and my main area of support is international graduate students. So you'll be hearing from me a lot in the future and hopefully meeting with me in a one-on-one -on -one or smaller group appointment in the coming weeks. Our office does uh, generally operate from Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. But of course, we know that many of you are outside of Canada and outside of that time frame. So we're happy to provide some flexibility in offering appointments, perhaps a bit before or after those hours. So we're going to be talking about a few things today. I wanted to start off with talking about our international student support programs. And after we go through this, we'll be talking a bit about immigration and any updates related to COVID-19. So as you may imagine uh, from the description I gave of what the advisors do at our office, one of our main areas of support is of course providing immigration support to uh, incoming and returning international students. So we have a few different ways that we do this. One is through our immigration insights group advising. So we do offer a group session workshops where we talk about one specific immigration document or process. So for example, applying for a study permit extension, applying for a post-graduation work permit, applying for a temporary resident visa, etc. So they are one hour presentations where we allow a maximum of 30 students. We go through a presentation deck uh, similar to what we're doing today, explain the full process and then answer questions at the end. We also offer one-on-one -on -one appointments. So these are great if you have a really specific question that's quite unique to your situation or perhaps you've attended a group advising session and needed a bit of additional information. So wherever possible, I will do my best to see you in those one-on-one -on -one advising appointments so I'm able to, first of all, get to know you a bit better and then learn a bit more about your situation and figure out how our office can support you. Our office does also issue status letters for international students at Ryerson. So these letters are usually specific to the needs of international students, meaning are usually related to immigration. So if you need a letter to extend your study permit, apply for a temporary resident visa, 
a co-op work permit or any other immigration types of documents or processes, please do contact our office and we'll be happy to process that request. Status letters uh, generally do take us five business days to issue. Normally we do issue hard copies, but as of right now, as you know, we're working from home. So we are issuing these letters via email as PDFs and hard copies may be available at a later date if we're able to provide them. So in addition to providing immigration support, we also like to have a lot of fun and host different types of events at ISS. So I'll tell you a bit about what we have going on. Graduate student support. So that's one of the areas that I help uh, run. What it aims to do is create community and opportunities for international masters and PhD students to connect with each other. We also aim to facilitate intercultural learning and connect graduate students such as yourselves to academic and career related resources. So this is one of the favorite parts of, of my portfolio in supporting graduate students is putting together these events for, for all of you. I've done some pre-planning for this semester and I have some uh, really great events planned for all of you for the end of September as well as into November and early December involving some great campus partners that I think you'll really benefit from. So I'll be sharing more information on those events closer to the date. One of the other really unique programs we offer through our office is Cultural Connections. So Cultural Connections is an intercultural understanding program that provides students with the opportunity to connect across differences and similarities. The program promotes acceptance and appreciation of different cultures and capacity to function interdependently with people from different cultural backgrounds. The Cultural Connections offerings are a choose your own adventure style, meaning that you take part in as much or as little as you'd like. So one of the really great parts about this program is that it aims to bring uh, international students and domestic students together. So the program is open to everyone across the university. And it's really unique and uh, you learn a lot from it. So I'd really encourage you to get involved if that's something that's of interest to you. The University Health Insurance Plan, or UHIP for short. So if you've taken a look at your account balance for your tuition, you may see there's a charge on your account for UHIP. So UHIP is, it's generally a mandatory insurance plan for international students and it's quite a good plan. It is equivalent to the provincial health coverage. We will be doing a, an in-depth information session on UHIP in terms of coverage and what it offers uh, later in the month, so on September 22nd from 2 to 3. Uh, we, we will be recording the session as well because I recognize the time isn't great um, people in, in other countries. but. Uh, something I did want to mention is that if you will not be able to physically come to Canada in the fall semester because of travel restrictions, you will be able to defer your UHIP fees to the winter 2021 semester. So what that means is that we have a request form um, that we'll be providing you with after the presentation that you can fill out, confirm that you won't be in Canada in the fall, and we will defer your UHIP fees to the winter semester. If you are in Canada or will be in Canada, um, you do need to keep this coverage and uh, the UHIP coverage year begins on September 1st, which is just around the corner. So after September 1st, we're able to issue your UHIP cards. Our office does administer this insurance, so we'll be able to provide you a phys or sorry, an, an e-copy of your UHIP card if you request that from us. Normally we do print them out, but as we're working from home, we're happy to send it to you via email. In case uh, you may not know, orientation week across the university began on Monday. We normally have one orientation week, uh, but actually this year we have two. So it, uh, orientation weeks, I should say, they did start on Monday and they'll continue through this week as well as into next week. So at International Student Support, we have a lot going on. We have our Let's Talk orientation session, which is strongly recommended that you attend. There is one that's taking place actually right after this presentation, so starting at 11 a.m. There's also one taking place later this afternoon at 3 p.m. We will be recording one of these sessions in case the times are not convenient to you and you'll be able to access them at a later date. So 
in the presentation for the Let's Talk, we'll be going more into depth about what our office provides in terms of supports, as well as provide important information about immigration compliance and go a bit more in depth about UHIP. So please do join us if you're able to. I'm going to put the, the link for the invitation into the chat because we won't have time to register you if you haven't already done so. So if you are planning on attending the Let's Talk orientation sessions today, either at 11 or 3, and you haven't registered, I've just uh, put the Zoom link and password into the chat. So don't worry about registering. You can just automatically enter the session using that link and password. And sorry, it's also the same link and password for either the 11 a.m. or the 3 p.m. session today. Another event we have coming up that I planned with all of you in mind specifically is the Grad Mixer. So that is taking place on Monday at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And what that is, it's a social event intended for all of you to meet other graduate students in different faculties. So I know that you often get the opportunity to attend events within your program and your faculty, but with things being online right now, it's much harder for you to meet students in perhaps faculty of science or faculty of communication and design. So I'd really encourage you to come. The event is really lighthearted. It's, it's nothing serious. We're going to play some games, introduce students to each other from different faculties, and uh, we do have some prizes available. So I would really love it if you can come. It's going to be a lot of fun, and it's on Monday again at 10 a.m. We're also hosting our annual International Student Welcome Party next Thursday, so that's September 3rd, from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. So we're having live entertainment at our event, specifically a live DJ. So I know this time of day for a lot of you is quite late in the evening, so think of it as an evening party for you. You can turn up your speakers and, and just have lots of fun with our live DJ. We also will have the president of the university, President Lashmi, addressing some activities and prizes as well. So we would really love it if you came to our orientation events. It's a really great opportunity for you to meet other students as well as other members of the professional staff team. In the chat box, I'm going to put in the link of where you can find all of our upcoming events. So. We use a platform called Connect RU. Connect RU is a platform that is used by lots of departments and units across the university to post their events. So you can see events from other departments as well, but uh, the link I provided is specifically for events uh, that ISS is hosting. You can click on them, get more information, and then RSVP to any events that you're interested in joining. That concludes the part about our office, our supports, the events that we have going on right now. And now I'm going to move into some immigration updates for international students related to COVID-19. So if you joined a session earlier in June, I believe it was, you would have heard some of these updates, but things have evolved since then. So the section has been updated and we'll just jump right into it. First, we're going to talk about study permits, as I know that's something that's on the minds of most incoming international students. So I know a lot of you have voiced concerns about applying for your study permit due to lockdowns, um, internal travel restrictions, and visa office closures. Right now, I would strongly recommend that you apply for your study permit online as soon as possible if you have not already done so. If you've done so, that's wonderful. I'm really glad to hear it. If you haven't done so, uh, the application process can be completed and submitted online as long as you have access to the internet, a free download of Adobe Reader for the application forms, and you're able to scan or take a clear photo of your documents that you'll need to upload, such as a copy of your passport. So if for whatever reason you're unable to provide one of one or more, I should say, of the requested documents. What you can do is upload an explanation letter in its place, explaining why you're not able to obtain that document at this time. Right now, your application will not be refused due to missing documentation. 
As many of you know, biometrics centers around the world, most of them remain closed at this time, including in Canada. So the centers here have not yet opened either. You are not required to give your biometrics, meaning your fingerprints and photos, until the site closest to you reopens. Effective July 14th, 2020, so just over a month ago, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, which is the body who handles uh, immigration to Canada. So what they did is they implemented a temporary two-stage study permit approval process. This temporary process allows applicants to count the time that they are studying online abroad towards the post-graduation work permit. Once you have applied for your study permit, pending you've applied before September 15th, and pending that you do satisfy all the requirements and obtain a full approval of your study permit at a later date. So as services do begin to reopen, if you had any missing documents in your application, they may be requested and you may uh, start to see an issuance of an approval in principle. So after providing the documentation listed on the slide, it's possible that your approval in principle will be issued. We are starting to see students who are receiving their approvals in principles, which is wonderful to see. So we, do, we are seeing the approval in principle process starting to begin. So you can begin studying online again as soon as you have submitted your study permit application. And as long as you've done so before September 15th, you can count the time you're studying online in this fall semester, so September until uh, the end of December 2020, towards the length of your post-graduation work permit. With respect to the study permit application, you will receive the final approval once it's determined that you've met all eligibility and admissibility requirements. So that includes submitting biometrics and any other necessary uh, documents such as an immigration medical exam or a police certificate, wherever applicable. Once you receive a final approval, you will be able to travel to Canada pending travel restrictions are loosened or lifted. Um, as you may know, uh, many of the Canadian visa offices are working at a reduced capacity, meaning that your application processing times are quite lengthy, definitely longer than normal. So we've gotten a lot of questions about beginning your program before you get that full study permit approval. So again, I just want to reinforce because I know a lot of students are nervous about this, is the answer is yes, you can start uh, studying online before you get the full approval of your study permit. Should you begin to study prior to the full approval of your study permit? I just want to mention a few things to keep in mind. So the first consideration is that in the situation that your study permit application is refused, so, you know, we don't see a lot of refusals. They do happen, but hopefully this is not the case for you. So in the case that your study permit application is refused or rejected, you may not be able to proceed with your academic program once in-person in classes resume. And the reason would be is that you'd not be authorized to travel to Canada to study without a valid study permit. So in the event that your study permit application is refused, please do reach out to our office to meet with myself or one of the other advisors. If your application is refused, you cannot ask for it to be reconsidered. However, you can submit a new application with documentation or, or information that refutes your reasons for refusal. For those who aren't aware, if your application is refused, you'll be issued a letter and they will outline exactly why it is that the application was refused. So we'd be happy to go over that letter with you as well as talk about the documents you submitted and provide recommendations for resubmitting your application. If for whatever reason you resubmit and the application is rejected again, then I would recommend a discussion with your graduate program administrator on the feasibility of pursuing your full program online, even when in-person, sorry, classes resume. All right, I'm going to touch a bit on the post-graduation work permit now. Some important considerations when it comes to the post-graduation work permit, and I know this is a major draw for a lot of international students, especially graduate students. 
So if you do intend to remain in Canada via the PGWP after you finish your studies, please make sure that you have submitted your application for a study permit prior to September 15th. Right now, IRCC has indicated that as long as you submit that application before September 15th or have uh, approval in principle or a full study permit approval, then you can count your studies in the fall semester towards the length of your post-graduation work permit. Generally, any online studies are are not included in the length of the post-graduation work permit. So this is one of the changes that the government has made to respond to uh, the reality of a lot of students studying online during the pandemic. So again, just reinforcing that as long as you submit that study permit before September 15th, your classes are online for the fall semester. You can count these courses towards the length of your post-graduation work permit and you can you know, be authorized to engage in those studies. The eligibility for criteria for the post-graduation work permit. So it does allow students to complete up to a maximum of 50% via distance education or online. Uh, so, so there has been some clarification from IRCC uh, what they mean by 50% of your studies. Uh, they have specified that that means 50% of your courses. Right now, this is the current policy policy has been in place for quite some time. They have not made any changes to this 50% eligibility criteria. They have made changes to other policies, like I mentioned, like the ability to include um, the fall semester of online studies towards the length of a work permit when normally this isn't permissible. So if, if online studies do continue, I'm hopeful that um, there would be a response from IRCC if there's any flexibility on this regulation. However, right now it does remain the same uh, with no changes. All right, so moving on to travel restrictions. So at this time, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, travel restrictions for Canada are quite strict. Incoming international students, uh, for the most part, unfortunately are not exempt from the travel restrictions unless you already hold a valid study permit or a study permit approval letter issued on March 18th, 2020 or before, or you are traveling directly from the United States with a study permit approval letter. If you're traveling direct, directly from the US, then your study permit approval letter can be issued after March 18th. However, if you are traveling directly from any other country, then the approval letter would need to be issued before March 18th. So in addition to meeting one of those three travel criteria, you would also need to demonstrate that your travel is non-optional and non-discretionary. So if your courses will be held online in fall 2020, which is the majority uh, of students and programs, your travel could be considered optional or discretionary, meaning that you may not be able to enter the country. So uh, this means that in a lot of cases for um, students such as yourselves, incoming students, uh, your travel to Canada at this time based on current travel restrictions would not be allowed. We don't know when or if travel restrictions will be lifted or loosened or changed. So I would recommend frequently referring to the IRCC website that I'll provide at the end of uh, this presentation as well as keeping an eye on um, emails you get from our office. Uh, once you are um, enrolled and you're, uh, sorry, once you're, you're incoming students right now, but uh, at the beginning of the fall semester, you will start receiving bi-weekly emails from our office. Um, and we do our best to provide all our recent immigration updates that are pertinent to you. Um, so keep your eye on that for changes to travel restrictions or other immigration uh, policies or procedures. If you do meet the travel uh, exemptions and your travel uh, will be considered non-optional and non-discretionary, please know that anyone entering Canada by air, um, also by land, I didn't include that in the slide, but if you are entering by air or by land, you will be required to pass a health screening. Uh, so if you're traveling by air, uh, the airline will provide uh, a health screening uh, prior to boarding your flight, as well as you'll be subject to another 
health screening upon arrival in Canada. So if you are presenting any symptoms, either prior to boarding your flight or upon arrival, it's possible that you will be denied entry. Um, if you're clear and able to enter Canada, you are required to self-isolate for a period of 14 days. So this applies to um, anyone traveling to Canada from a different country, including the US. You have to quarantine for 14 days um, and you must have a plan in place for your quarantine. So when you are entering Canada, you'll be met by a border service uh, agent and they will have questions about your quarantine plan to make sure that you have the appropriate resources um, in place in order for you to remain in your place of quarantine for those 14 days. Our office is uh, very happy to support you in coming up with a solid quarantine plan um, as well as referring you to um, partners that we have. So we do have partnerships with hotels um, in Toronto, both close to the airport and downtown, um, as well as currently with our on-campus residence buildings. So if you do need support in coming up with a quarantine plan or securing an accommodation, um, and you will be traveling within the next few weeks, please do contact our office to let us know as soon as possible so that we're able to get the information we need from you um, and help you in, in getting prepared for your travels. So on this slide, I've included some um, useful resources that I really recommend referring to if you're seeking additional information. Um, there's a document that will be provided to you after the presentation where you can click on these resources directly. Uh, the first is our office's website. So, um, just our general ISS website has a lot of information about immigration, our programs, uh, what's going on, etc. The second resource is the Student Affairs COVID-19 updates and information page. So it's on this page where we post updates um, about immigration policy in terms of changes in procedure or anything like that. So for those more quick updates um, regarding immigration, please refer to the second link. There is an FAQ section that includes a lot of information about uh, common questions that we're getting from students. Uh, finally, the last link is the IRCC travel restriction measures. So this page is updated frequently whenever there are um, updates to the travel restrictions. So it's a great page to consult as well. So um, I wanted to leave you with our social media information. Uh, we do update our Instagram most regularly as well as our Twitter. Our Facebook page is not as active, so I would really recommend following us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, from time to time, we do have some fun contests where you can win prizes, and we also post about what we have going on. So I really do recommend following us on those platforms um, so you can be up to date about what uh, events and programs we have going on. So that uh, concludes the formal part of my presentation. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have, whether it's about um, immigration or um, support or programs offered by ISS. So um, as Roel wrote in the chat, if we're not able to get to your questions today, I'm happy to provide an answer um, and then those will be provided to you um, a bit later. Thank you, Emma. Um, so we'll start with the first question. First question is from Kushal. I'm a citizen of India, currently residing in the US. Can I come to Canada by crossing the US-Canada border, provided I get a study permit now? Uh, so, so yes, if you are traveling directly from the US um, and you are issued a study permit approval letter, um, you could travel to Canada. The thing to keep in mind is that you also need to meet the requirements of the non-optional and non-discretionary travel. Um, so if your classes are fully online, this is a bit more tricky, uh, but not impossible. Our office is um, offering letters of support for students who do wish to travel to Canada, who do not have in-person um, courses. So um, the letter is, is really just meant to support your desire to enter Canada. Uh, and we're happy to provide more information about that in terms of other documents or information that you could present at the border to increase your chances of being 
uh, allowed entry. So um, please do contact our office um, at the email address on your screen to request the letter, um, as well as um, ask us any more questions you have about your travel to Canada. Um, again, your entry is not guaranteed. No one's entry is guaranteed. It is the um, decision of the border service uh, agency officer to let you in or not upon your uh, travel to Canada. Thank you, Emma. The next question is from Vikrant. I applied for a study permit on the 4th of June. Still no update. Is there any way to request for expediting the visa processing time? So um, unfortunately, we don't have any um, influence or access to um, the embassies or, or consulates, um, whether that's requesting expedited processing or or anything else. So um, unfortunately, there's no way to expedite your study permit. However, the most important thing is that you have already applied for it. Next question is from A. Meratei. Do you know how long it will take uh, to I receive AIP after document submission? Uh, so that is a great question. Uh, I do not know. We are seeing a lot of different timelines from students. Um, we're seeing some students receive the IAP, which is the approval in principle. So that's that two-step uh, study permit process I was talking about. Um, some students are getting them within a few weeks and other students who have applied perhaps in May and June are just getting them. So it's really difficult to say. Uh, but again, these things are out of your control. And the, the only thing that's within your control is submitting your study permit application. And as long as you've done that before September 15th, um, then you're in a, in a pretty good place immigration wise. Um, we have another question from Fikrant. As the first semester will happen online, so being in a different time zone, I can manage to work full time in my country while attending online classes. Will working full time and studying full time Will it, that have an adverse effect on my future PGWP immigration applications? Um, I would say that it shouldn't have any effect on your future applications. And the reason being is that any work performed outside of Canadian borders, um, so the Immigration um, and Refugee Protection Act, so that is the act that um, governs, governs um, Canadian immigration policies and procedures. So that does not apply to any work performed outside of Canada. So I, um, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Um, so we have a question from Karen Deep. I have deferred UHIP to winter term by submitting deferral form while enrolling for core courses. UHIP charges are still reflected into my account statement. Is it adjustable later or while the fall 2020 semester starts? Yes, so um, we will be adjusting those fees in the fall 2020 semester. So um, the way it works is that UHIP is uh, automatically included in international student tuition. So it has been automatically applied to all students tuition. And what we'll have to do is once we process the request from defer for deferral from that fee, we have to go in manually and remove that fee. Uh, so it will take a bit of time, but as long as you've completed the form and requested the deferral, then that's all the action you need to take. I have a question from Aman. Please confirm the deferral of the Ryerson University Student Union Health Plan as well as well to winter 2021, as we are being charged 340 CADZ for, the, uh, for that currently. Oh, 340 uh, Canadian. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the Ryerson Student Union Health and Dental Plan, so it's a separate dental plan, or sorry, a separate health insurance plan. Uh, it covers different things from, from UHIP, uh, and that plan is, is not administered by our office. It is administered by the Ryerson Student Union. So I'm about to put an email address in the chat. Um, it's health at rsuonline.ca. If you have questions about opting out of that plan, then please direct them to that office. Um, our office, unfortunately, doesn't have any uh, part in the RSU Health and Dental Plan. 
Thank you, Emma. Um, that will conclude today's question period. Uh, what we will do is I have the other questions that were posed in the chat room logged. I will send them to Emma for answers. And once we have the answers and put the slides together, we will ask your program administrator to send it all to you as well. Okay, uh, wonderful. Um, I want to thank you all for joining today. It was really great to have the opportunity to speak with you. And um, I hope to see you at our um, upcoming ISS orientation events. So for those of you who are available at 11, so just in 15 minutes, we have the Let's Talk orientation session starting. And then on Monday, um, 31st at 10 a.m., we have the uh, session specifically for international graduate students to meet each other and have a bit of fun. So I would really love to see you there. Uh, for also for me to get to know you a bit better as well.